Our COVID numbers actually have gone up significantly since the end of May. Um, the first five months, we had 21 cases, and since then, we, we've had 30, 32 cases since then, um, excluding today's admissions. Um, and we've had patients as young as eight days old to 18 years. Um, and more importantly, not just COVID, we've had anywhere between 10 to 15 um, multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome um, of children, which is um, a complication of COVID. And that is that to me is more scary. Um, and also, in addition to that, we did not see any RSV or other respiratory infections during the winter months. But as soon as June started, which is about when we stopped masking, we've had a lot of um, RSV, adenovirus, and other viruses. Um, I currently have three, three kids on my floor, on high floor, and two more are moving from the ICU. And it seems, it may be recent bias, but I think they seem to be sicker this year because I don't remember having like 75% of the RSV kids admit on high flow. Yeah. And it's a bit unusual for us um, being a small pediatric unit. And my colleagues on the outpatient side are seeing more um, COVID positive patients and they are seeing more respiratory infections than we will normally see by the end of, um, like getting to the end of summer. Um, we started doing synergies from mid-July, which typically we, st we start sometime in September. So it's crazy. it's crazy. And what's more scary is what's going to come ahead. We've already started planning for a surge in the numbers we are going to see once school starts. And from what I'm hearing on our list, um, list serves from my colleagues in other parts of the country that um, that have schools st um, started already, it's going to be quite a severe winter season um, for both COVID and other respiratory viruses. You know, Dr. Kofi, we, uh, we're we experiencing something similar. Obviously, you guys started experiencing it sooner than us, um, you know, in that early, you know, late May, early June period of time. Here in the St. Louis region, we started to see an increase in COVID-19 cases um, and, and, and hospitalizations started around mid-July. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, this is the most COVID-19 cases we've had in the hospital. And I think you said something that's super important for people to hear about, right, is that number one is that we're seeing more children in the hospital. And I believe that's probably more related to the fact that more kids are getting sick, that the Delta variant being a thousand times more transmissible. Now the kids are more sick. I'm not, I'm still not convinced that they're more severe than when we saw those previously. You know, we're seeing them. I'm not, I'm not convinced that. But what I thought you said is even more important. And what people forget about is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And I'm with you. Those, those guys are sick and they're scary. I mean, and, and while most of them get better, and what people have to remember, this is not acute COVID. This happens four to six weeks later. This You could have a little, you could have a healthy 10-year-old have mild COVID-19 infection, be fine. Six weeks later, they could be in your ICU with blood pressure medicines on, on a ventilator, and you're like, whoa. And now, thankfully, so far, most of them do fine, but they're sick, right? I mean, it's not... so. I think part of our conversation has to be about the fact that while you while while we're lucky that children with COVID-19 have not been as severely impacted as adults, that is no doubt. They still, children still get very sick. Children still can die. There's still over 500 deaths in our country from COVID-19. It cannot be taken lightly. And, and then, Dr. Kobe, I, I think the other piece of this that I hope we never experience ever, ever again is a summer RSV season, right? Like yeah. respiratory syncytial virus for everybody out there is a respiratory virus that Dr. Kofi takes care of. He knows all about this way better than I do. And he starts seeing it typically October, November, and it's gone by April. Yeah. It, October to April this year was like, wow, this is like unbelievable. And then June hits 
and it's a disaster zone of RSV, and, and it's continued to go up. I mean, we're still climbing. As a matter of fact, I was out last week on call, and, there, and I was talking to one of, one of my pediatric hospitalist friends. He's like, yeah, this whole row is RSV. I was like, what? And I, I think the severity, like, you you know this better than I. I, I and you, you've probably seen that on your listservs. It's, it'll come out. The literature will come out and say there was something different about the season this year. The question will remain is what's the reprieve we're going to get you know, after this surge, and I mean, do we do we reset the clock and then it becomes November again, or do we, or right, or do we not have? I who, the, I I think we're gonna have kind of this RSV peak go down, percolate along RSV peak in the winter time like we normally do, and then the question will be is what happens to influenza? And you did scare me a little bit with your listserv about the increase after school, um, and I'm yeah. hoping those increases are in places where they're not doing mass. So maybe we'll get some more people that will put masks on in the schools. Matter of fact, I think in Tennessee, um, yeah, they, they had to like Williamson County had to yep. start last Monday because like yeah, COVID had um, positive positive cases just went out of the out yeah, of their yeah. group, and yeah. I heard it on the news. So don't like. I don't know. No, I'm with you. I mean, we've heard a few of those, right? Uh, I have I have a pediatric ID colleagues in North Carolina that talk about two school districts in North Carolina who have reversed. Or they were going mask optional. They reversed a mask mandate. I think there's a school district down in uh, Florida that's done the exact same thing within three or four yeah. days. We're seeing the reports, but I, I agree with you 100%, right? Y- y- these are news media reports. I think you and I both in this era realize that we want to be very um, – confident and know exactly what the data is before we wanted to say oh this is what's happening for sure yeah yeah so it will be i hope we are over preparing and we'll have a slower season but if what the projections are come well, true then we are going to be busy and it's yeah. fun but it speaks to why we're here right it speaks to why yeah. we're talking about covid vaccine i mean we are speaking to something because I mean, I know you guys down in, in Springfield don't need any more admissions to the hospital. We don't need any more admissions to the hospital in St. Louis because, you know, I think what people forget is when the beds are full and our staff is swamped, things that we can take care of very easily don't get taken care of. So you can get in a car accident you need immediate help. You might not get immediate help. That could lead to some detrimental outcomes that was preventable because we could have prevented the infections that we're seeing. That's 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 the you know we we've seen that we know this. Yeah. From January, so year to date, we have had fifty-one COVID admissions. These are diagnosed COVID sick kids who needed to be in a hospital. Um, from beginning of June till yesterday, we. Um, we've had 32 of that. So prior to that, I'll have to do the math, but the number is basically almost is about, we've gone like 50% more in two months compared to the previous five months. Um, that's what we are seeing with regards to the COVID numbers. And they seem sicker than before. And we are seeing younger kids coming. Previously, we had older teenagers usually with some um comorbid condition so they may be diabetic or they're obese or they have asthma and they'll come in and um, they stay for a couple of days on oxygen and they go home we've had a few kids who needed to be on a ventilator we've had several who needed to who needed more than just oxygen uh, um, oxygen through a nasal cannula they needed some respiratory support but not in an intubation so we are seeing them we are seeing more numbers and they are sicker than before well i you know there's no doubt i think we're all concerned about what this means now what we did learn last year across the country is that if you put mitigation strategies in place, so mitigation mean right or preventative strategies that included masking, keeping people home that are sick with colds, right? Both students and staff, washing our hands, using some distance. As a matter of fact, you don't have to use as much distance as we thought. I mean, just doing three feet is probably plenty. Um, if we do these things, you can 
limit the transmission of COVID-19 within the schools. That's even without vaccination, right? Like that's that was before vaccination. So actually, I think we're in a better state in the end if we have those things in place, right? So if we get all of our staff vaccinated, we get all of our students el- that are eligible to be vaccinated, vaccinated, then we add masks because we're having this surge. We do some distances. We stay home when we're sick. It's going to work, right? No matter what the variant is, the mask is going to work. The dis- is, That's not going to be any different in my book. So while I am concerned, I'm most concerned in areas where we're not having a lot of masking for the school environment, just because it's, it's just a concentrated place. I mean, I think of a school classroom, you almost like think like a big household, right? Because you're all together and you're to- right? And we know in households, especially with Delta variant, it gets in there, everybody gets sick. Yeah, uh, w- uh, what we are afraid of is the numbers are going to significantly go up and we are going to see small kids who are sick and they are going to be sicker because of the Delta variant. And we also are afraid we are going to see more of other respiratory viruses. Um, so we we are making preparations to be able to handle the numbers should that happen. And to echo what, the, um, what Dr. Nilan said, if we can keep our students masked, if we can do a bit of social distancing and if we can get them vaccinated, we will have a good year. Um, I was really impressed last year when um, Springfield Public Schools did a modified quarantine where like if both students were masked and um, one was exposed, they could still come to school. Most kids ended up not missing a lot of school. We did not have a lot of transmissions in school because they adhered to the mitigation strategies we've already talked about. So I'm confident if we can do that and if we can get a significant number of our students who can get a vaccine vaccinated, then our preparation will be will be over prepared for what will actually happen. But I'm afraid if we don't do that or what we are actually afraid might happen is Springfield may be okay because they have a masking policy, but the surrounding areas are not going to be good because there are no masking or like there are no mask mandates and the vaccination rate tends to be lower outside Springfield. So we may get a lot more patients from from the surrounding um, communities. And you guys should know, right? I mean, the CDC has said to me, look, Springfield was ahead of the game with modified quarantine. And you know, the reason why modified quarantine is in the CDC policy is because of Springfield. Springfield, yeah. Spring, Springfield's experience with Gr- Springfield, Green County, the likes of Dr. You know, John Mooney, Katie Towns, that whole crew, yeah. Um, really did the the important investigations to demonstrate that modified quarantine is safe, and that's why we, that's why you see it. I mean, I think it's super impressive. I mean, I I'm, I feel lucky to know the folks down in Springfield, and the, the community should be super proud of that. Springfield really is one of the biggest reasons why kids can have modified quarantine this coming year. So I think that vaccines, uh, especially the mRNA vaccines are very efficacious. Now, people worry about it being a new technology, but correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Newland, it's been in studies, it's been studied for the last 20, 30 years. I believe that Pioneer more emigrated in, um, to the United States in the early 80s and started working on it from there. So even though this was the first time was used in a vaccine, it is not a new technology and it's actually a very efficient way of introducing a vaccine or like the vaccine into our bodies it does not go into your um the nucleus of your cell i'm getting a bit technical so it's not going to affect your dna as soon as your body translates the mrna into the spike protein in this case of covid it, the body gets rid of it so there is no remnants left in your system and the vaccines work extremely well like 94 and 95 percent the benefit of the vaccine far outweighs the risks 
and most of the adverse effects we know about is you make your arm and you saw where you got the injection and usually with a second dose you will have you may have a fever some muscle aches and a headache and it may last anywhere from 12 to 48 um, from 24 to 48 hours um, but so far we know it's protective against the delta variant for severe disease and hospitalization so it's it's very efficient and it works as it's intended to work it's a great vaccine dr kofi said the best i mean it, the effect, effectiveness is amazing um if someone would ask me a year ago what what effectiveness i was hoping for i was like man give me 60 to 70 percent and i'll do backflips i mean this you know now we have a 95 percent and, and even the effectiveness against delta is delta variant is, is really good I mean, I think that what, what people worry about, so why aren't people getting it? Well, you know, we hear a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, one of them is infertility. I, the number of times I've had somebody say, hey, I don't want my teenage daughter to get the vaccine, so I'm worried about infertility. Let's be clear. There's no biological plausibility that this vaccine is going to impact a child, a, a, a woman's infertility. As a matter of fact, the uh, obstetricians have recommended it for women. The, you know, maternal medicine people rep, re, recommending it for women. Um, and no vaccine beyond a six week period of watching adverse events has long term impacts. So infertility is not happening. Right. So th this is a vaccine that needs to be done. I think the other one that is brought up that's led to people hold off, especially for their children and their teens, is they've heard about this inflammation of the heart or myocarditis. I think it's really important to address this up front. Right. So what, what we have heard and what we have learned is that in younger individuals, y younger than 30, especially boys, there's a the risk is about the following about 40 to 50 per 1 million people. OK, so let's be clear, 30 to 50 per 1 million people. So let's put that into perspective, right? Because the question will be and let's I should step back. Those 30 to 50 people, their self, they, they get better quickly. What the reports are is they have some inflammation of the heart. It's a little pain the next day with some anti inflammatories like, you know, super powerful ibuprofen one might say it gets better and that's been that's great to hear now what we need to ask is well why are they why would they keep doing that if you see that well here's the thing we don't know if it's truly associated though it looks like it but what's the risk of getting heart involvement if you get true covid 19. well guess what guys there is a study that looked at young individuals college individuals where they if you had COVID, they actually looked at a picture of your heart and they found that one to two percent had inflammation of the heart. One to two percent. So Jay, you're like, well, what does that mean in a per million? Well, it's like 20,000. Yes, 20,000 per million. So you guys can do the math. 20,000 to 50, right? It is way, 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 way more beneficial to get this vaccine, even if you're a young male in the higher risk, higher risk, right, very, which is very, 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 very low risk to get the vaccine. I think this is why my son has gotten the vaccine. This is why my daughters have gotten the vaccine. They're 15, 17, 19. I mean, like, super important. And I and I just like to add, just reiterate, right? The pandemic is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. The pandemic has always been the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Now it's the willingly unvaccinated, except if you're a child that's in the under 12 group that can't get it. So we can do this and I think more vaccination should happen. Well, so what we've learned and so we're we're actually helping participate in some of the COVID-19 vaccine trials for this younger age group. Um, it's not clear exactly how staged it's gonna be I can tell you if I was a betting man, and I'm not, um, I would. it's going to be Pfizer. Pfizer will likely be the first vaccine because they're ahead of Moderna, though Moderna will be following it for the younger age groups. You know, we had a report back in April that suggested, it was a New York Times report that suggested 2 to 11 would come out in September. Well, it's not going to be September. It's not going to be September. Likely, my bet is currently it's going to be November I think, and it might be two to 11. So I think the two to 11s might be November. I'd say good chance it will definitely be six to 11. We just don't know that 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 fine of detail. 
Moderna is really in the process of doing their big randomized trial. Pfizer's already really done theirs. So Moderna won't be until 2022, approved in 2022. I think there'll be full licensure of the Pfizer vaccine probably before they get approvals for the younger age groups. But we will get there. I mean, I, the, the point of it is, you know, I don't see there's no signal at this point with everything that's happened that we should be worried that there's not going to be, a, be a, a vaccine for the younger children. And that changes the game again. Right. It really changed it when now you have the whole population pretty much eligible for vaccine. I'm actually looking forward to it. If there is anything I need to add, I have a, a 10 year old that if I could vaccinate um i would have vaccinated simply because for me the risk of the vaccine like the vaccine side effects is way lower than the risk of her get, getting covid because even if she gets covid and she's asymptomatic or she's had she's mildly symptomatic we still have kids who are having the long covid symptoms there are kids with yeah tired all the time or they they are not they are not able to focus as much as they used to or they are ha having persistent headaches or their heart is beating their resting heart rate is slightly higher than normal so i would rather just do the vaccine and deal with the side effects which most vaccines if you are going to show a side effect it's within the first six to eight weeks so for me, that's a risk I'm so willing to take. My son got it as soon as I think they approved it and he got it on the second day after they approved, like the second day Cox started giving it. So I can't speak hard, like I'm eagerly waiting and I know most of my colleagues are, are waiting for it to be approved. Probably like you said, for the two to 11 year group um, so we can get all of them vaccinated. I think, um, Dr. Newland, I, do you guys have a, a COVID clinic for kids? We've started, yeah, we do have some a COVID clinic that we're starting to see, especially these that have probably this, this these long haulers, yep. And across the country, most children's hospitals are beginning to have COVID clinic for these long haulers. And we did not think kids were going to have it, but there are kids with, prolonged symptoms so they were never too sick to be in the hospital but it may be they get severe headaches or their sense of smell and taste has not come back after six months or they are they, are, they have excessive tiredness so all plays into it they may not get too sick to be in the hospital but yeah which child is going to be a long hauler which child is going to be asymptomatic, which child is going to end up in a hospital. So that speaks to making sure you get a vaccine if it's available for you and your child. Number one, talk to your doctor, but the reality of it is there has been no condition at this point that's been stated that you can't get the vaccine for. And, and, the, and I should say the only thing is if that you've had an anaphylactic response, meaning you had an allergic response needing respiratory help, right? Or you needed an epinephrine shot to something called polyethylene glycol. That's like really, or, or another vaccine component. That is only thing that is really the contraindication, meaning you can't get it. Otherwise, we're basically recommending it for everybody. Even if you're someone that's had COVID-19, I'm like, look, you've had COVID-19, I'm sorry, but let's make sure you get vaccinated as soon as you're not infectious because you're going to be better protected against the future variants. So let's do this. And so I haven't seen anything. Dr. Kofi, you have anything that you found that suggests they shouldn't get it? I think unless you have same kind of anaphylaxis or you got a first dose and you, you had severe anaphylaxis with, that's why we make them wait 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, because if they are going to have anaphylaxis, it's usually the first 15 minutes, usually no more than an hour. Those are the only conditions I would recommend not getting it. Because 
even if you are immunodeficient, so if you have cancer, you're on treatment for cancer, you have some immunodeficiency syndrome, or you tend to get sick often, you actually have the more reason to get it. Because you do not, your your body is already a little bit compromised. You do not want to be hit with COVID. So they are, they are the ones who are supposed to get it. And I will especially encourage it for um, kids who have underlying health conditions. So those with asthma, those who are a little bit on the obese kids, those with diabetes, um, I'll even say we are not there yet, but like if you have any long-term respiratory disease, I think you should get it if you've been treated for cancer or if you have any yawn, any medication that makes you um, immunocompromised, you should get it as well. Um, because when you get sick, you may tend to be sicker than um, an otherwise healthy child. For me, there are global and personal reasons why we all need to get vaccinated. Do it so that you don't, you won't be a, a, a source of infection for your neighbor or for someone who is immunocompromised. And then on a personal level, the benefits far outweighs the risk. Talk to your physician. Don't depend on anything you read on Facebook or hearsay. Talk to a trusted physician or a trusted healthcare worker and look look at the research yourself. You can go to Pfizer's website, CDC. Uh, Dr. Kofi says are great. I mean, the reality of it is COVID vaccines are way out. Um, it's our way out. Uh, and the more we can get vaccinated, the better. Um, I think that there's a lot of us out there and there's a lot of people out there that are on the fence. Um, I know there's going to be those that we, we struggle with and there's probably many of you out there that you know that person who's just adamant against it. Well, they might not be as adamant. So what I'd say is, as Dr. Kobe says, it works. It works great. It works so so much better, and it's and it's so important. But but support your fellow person. Be kind. Keep telling them the facts. Keep working with them to get vaccinated. You know, get vaccinated for yourself, for your loved ones, for your children. Um, and we'll, we'll get through this, um, but we need to think about being kind um, and that and part of being having kindness is being vaccinated and getting the COVID-19 vaccine for each other.